Last week we read the passage of scripture that nobody reads when it comes to the Christmas story, and today we're going to talk about the character in the Christmas story that there's less conversations about him than all the other Christmas characters. We know lots about Mary, we know lots about the wise men, we know lots about the shepherds and the angels. We don't know that much about Joseph. So I'd like us to focus our time today on Joseph. We're in Matthew, the first chapter, and it says, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Uh, there are lots of social rules related to engagement, and this is a time of year when lots of people actually become engaged, so this might be helpful to someone in the room this morning. For example, is it appropriate to post a picture of your engagement ring on social media? And the answer is yes, but not just the ring. The appropriate way to go about it is to have a picture of you and your fiance with your left hand prominently displayed. When sharing the news about your engagement, it is best that your parents do not learn of your engagement from social media. Just saying. We had a guy in the first service, he went to work and someone at work told him that his daughter was engaged and he didn't know anything about it. I know, spoiler alert, huh? That's, yeah. Uh, when sharing the news, start with your immediate family, followed by your friends, extended family. Social media is the last option you exercise. And then, if you're having an engagement party, who do you invite to the engagement party? Just remember, whoever you invite to the party, you invite to the wedding, okay? So if you don't want them at your wedding, you need to think twice about that. So that's usually family members, the bridal party, and close friends. So what are the rules if the engagement breaks up? What happens to the ring? Turns out there's rules about this too. If the groom calls off the wedding, then the bride is under no obligation to return the ring. I'm hearing go, oh, that's an inch. If the bride calls off the wedding, it is assumed that the ring will be returned. If the ring is a family heirloom, it is assumed that it will be returned to the family that it came from. Now, believe it or not, there actually have been people who have been taken to court over engagement rings given at Christmas time, and this is something you should be aware of. There are people who have made the argument, and they have won in court, that since the ring came at Christmas time, it was a gift that had no conditions on it. It's just a Christmas gift. Just saying. Uh, the truth is, most people don't wind up in court on engagement rings or engagement uh, commitments. But that was not the case in the ancient world. In the ancient world, if you were engaged, that was as binding as a marriage, and it actually required a divorce proceeding to break it off, where legal reasons had to be given. When we look at Joseph, Joseph discovers that Mary is pregnant, and he knows he's not the father. 
And uh, the, the phrase that's used in scripture, it's a, it's a very gentle euphemism, it said, because they had not yet come together. So Joseph wants to be faithful to the law, and that would require him to actually end this engagement. And that's exactly what he was considering to do. And uh, that means he would have to take legal status. There are steps that he would have to go through. And that's where we find that God invades his dream and sends an angel with an important message. And we are surprised at what the message is. And this is one of the hidden gifts of Christmas. God helped Joseph to find the courage to overcome his fear. Uh, the truth is, is that a lot more of our decision-making is based on fear than almost anything else. And you might not think that that's true, so I'll give you three clues to determine if your decisions that you are making are based on fear. The first clue is this. Are you making a decision to avoid something rather than to accomplish something? Anytime we're trying to avoid something, you can classify that as a fear-based decision. Secondly is, are you procrastinating, just putting something off, hoping that things will work themselves out before you actually have to make a decision? That's usually a form of fear. And then thirdly, are you allowing someone else to make the decision for you so you don't have to feel responsible for it? The simple truth is, a lot of things get uh, done out of fear. And by the way, a lot of people appear to be angry, and actually their anger is nothing more than fear that is trying to find confidence in spite of the fact that they feel out of control. A lot of people's anger is actually fear-based. They're just, they don't know what else to do, so they just get loud. Well, when the angel comes to Joseph in the dream, what he tells him is not to be afraid to take Mary home as his wife. The thing that has to be confronted in Joseph for him to be able to proceed in his part of the Christmas story and his partnership in the redemption of uh, God in our world is that he has to face down his own fears. And Joseph had good reason to be afraid. If you were going to marry someone and you discovered that they were pregnant and you knew that you were not the father, that would be reason to be afraid. It's an indication this individual has been unfaithful. And what does that mean for the possible relationship going forward? It's a challenge. It's something to be afraid of. So that's a natural fear. It's also something else is that if he went ahead with the wedding, people would assume that they had broken the social morals of their time and they had engaged in sex before marriage and as a result, they would be considered social outcasts. And I'll deal with more of that in just a, a moment. But the point is here, Joseph had to find courage to do two things. First of all, he had to find courage to do the right thing. And I wish I could tell you that anytime you're going to do the right thing in the world, that that will always be applauded and it will always be approved of. But as soon as you say something is the right thing, there are people who get frustrated with that kind of language because they think so much is situational. It really isn't a right thing to do. There's just the appropriate thing to do in that circumstance. And Scripture tells us something very different. The Bible says that Joseph wanted to honor the law. He was faithful to the law of God. There was an appropriate way to respond here. But it also takes courage to do the gracious thing. And this is where people also struggle. We worry that if we do the gracious thing, someone will think something less about us. It is clear he was not comfortable publicly humiliating Mary. That was not what he wanted to do. He obviously loved her. He wanted to divorce her quietly and privately. And here's the thing I want you to see. You cannot live in grace and disgrace other people. If you are disgracing other people, you are not operating in grace. You might feel very right, but that's only part of the courage you need is to do the right thing. It also takes courage to do the gracious thing. When your relationship with God is the most important thing in your life, then you will use grace. When your reputation is the most important thing in life, you will use disgrace. And I wish I could tell you that religious environments are kind of exempt from this reality, but you see a lot of disgrace go on in religious environments. And what we have to understand is that is usually based about fear of reputation. If I'm connected with someone who's not measuring up in some way, if I'm seen as supportive of them in any way, then it could affect how people perceive me. That fear, please hear me, that fear will keep us from being a redemptive influence in our world. 
If you are more concerned about your reputation, then you will disgrace other people. So enter the angel. He comes into Joseph's dream. And he says, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. The primary reason we do not live out our faith is because we are living in fear. It takes courage to live out your faith. It takes courage. Some people think that faith is just risk, that you go around and you just try to basically dig a hole and trust God to pull you out of it. That's not what faith is. Faith is not about you finding risks to take. Faith is about you willing to be obedient at God's direction. We're not trying to make something happen. We're just being obedient to what God tells us he wants to do. So the primary reason we do not live out our faith is that we're living in fear. Now, your faith may not eliminate your fear, but it will always confront it. God refuses to leave us as victims to our fears. So the angel explains to Joseph, Mary has not been unfaithful. Mary has not been immoral. This is a miracle. And can you imagine what a tender moment it must have been when Joseph goes to Mary and says the wedding is still on, that he believes her, that God has confirmed something in him about her. The second thing that Joseph needed courage in is God helped Joseph to find courage to endure embarrassment, to endure embarrassment. I don't know what kind of things have happened in your life that uh, are embarrassing. I actually went online to find like the 10 most embarrassing things that can happen. And as it turns out, I, I really can't talk about most of them in church. Uh, <laughs> while we would probably have many of us experience in them, we would prefer that we not discuss them in rooms like this. But in the ancient world, the concept of embarrassment was even stronger than now. It was an honor-based culture. In an honor-based culture, once you were embarrassed, once you lost face in society, it could have lifelong implications in terms of your relationships, your opportunities, your economic situation. It was very, very serious. So when Joseph and Mary had a baby that was born before nine months after their wedding date, everyone would do the math. Everyone would figure out something's not right here. And in that culture, it wouldn't just be something that they would momentarily uh, call to your attention and then let go. They would carry that with you for the rest of your life. You would be considered a moral outsider. You would be excluded from lots of opportunities in society. People would whisper about you whenever they saw you or saw you together with your spouse. And when the child was born, you would overhear them say things about that child. In fact, when you read through the Gospels, even as an adult, Jesus is still being accused of being an illegitimate child. There are people who make that accusation of him after he's 30 years old. This stuff doesn't let go. They will overhear people saying things about their child when they walk down the street or when their child is attempting to play with other children. And Joseph and Mary could try to explain things to people. They could tell people, look, this is not a matter of unfaithfulness. This is not a matter of immorality. There was something that was conceived in her by the Holy Spirit. An angel came and told Mary. An angel came to me in a dream and told me, it's all okay. So how many think all their friends and family members would go, oh, well, that explains it all. No, they would say that in addition to being a moral outcast, you are a religious nut. That's what they would do. And we might think that that doesn't have any implications for us, but it does. You don't have to claim that your child has been conceived by the Holy Spirit to have people roll their eyes at you in our culture. All you have to do is acknowledge that you believe that there is a God and that he is actively working to make all things right in our world. All you have to do is declare that you believe the Bible is actually true. People will roll their eyes at you. All you have to do is admit that you believe that there's something after death and people will roll their eyes at you. If you actually forgive other people, if you are generous with other people, if you commit to being part of a family of faith and living out those values in healthy and God-honoring ways, there are going to be people who look at you and say, you've got to be kidding me. You don't actually believe that stuff, do you? 
Here's what you need to see. The price that we pay in our culture is not with our life. The price we pay in our culture is with our reputation. Do you see the connection? Joseph and Mary, it was their reputation that was being assaulted too. They had to live with an ongoing embarrassment of what God was doing in their life. And you will also live with an ongoing embarrassment of what God is doing in your life because people don't accept it or understand it. Joseph and Mary's reputation was on the line. People can consider you naive if you believe in the incarnation, if you believe in the crucifixion, if you believe in the resurrection of Jesus. People in our culture are far more, far more likely to believe that there's benefits in breathing exercises than there is in prayer. So, yes, you, you will be embarrassed. But please hear me. Just because someone has shamed you does not mean that you need to live ashamed. There are people who will try to embarrass us, but being ashamed is when we respond out of that shame to someone else. It doesn't take any grace to be nice to someone who thinks exactly like you do. By the way, there isn't anybody who thinks exactly like you do. And if, they, if you think they do, they're just pretending. Nobody thinks exactly like we do. We have to learn that grace is actually what is required when someone is suspicious of our faith. When someone doesn't buy into what we believe, that's when grace is required. It takes a lot of courage to live out your faith, even in our culture. The third area of courage is that God helped Joseph find the courage to surrender control of life to the Lord of life. Now, this is interesting. The angel told Joseph, told Joseph this. He said, uh, go home and take Mary as your wife. By the way, Joseph considered this a command because we read in the passage from Matthew, it says, when he woke up, he did everything that the angel commanded. So this was not just a recommendation. It wasn't a suggestion. Joseph considered this a command. But it didn't end there. He said, and when the baby is born, you are to give him the name Jesus because he has come to save people from their sins. In the ancient world, it was the complete sovereign right of a father to name their child. And so by naming the child Jesus, God is saying, this is not your child, this is my son, and I choose the right to name him. But by Joseph giving him that name, Joseph is saying not only he accepts that right of God to name him, but he's taking on the responsibility to adopt him, and he will care for him in every way. So that's an important thing to remember that's happening here. God is exercising his right. You should go and marry this woman, and the name of the child will be Jesus. See, when we come to God, do we really believe that he has the right to give direction in our life? I think lots of us feel like Christianity is, I make my choices, and then I ask God either to forgive me or to fix it for me, or both. And really, the truth is, is that when we come to God, if he is God, doesn't it make sense that he knows more than you do? Just look at the person next to you and say it with a smile, but say, God knows more than you do. Just tell them, all right? Just tell them that God knows more than you do. When we consider following Jesus, we are often tempted to negotiate the terms of our following him. There are lots of people who say, well, I would be a Christian if, and please hear, whatever follows the if is the real God of your life. And you should know God doesn't share his throne with anyone. If we're going to be a follower of Christ, if we're going to be a believer in God, then it has to be on his terms. You cannot access unconditional grace through your own conditions. You see, God accepts us unconditionally, but we want to accept God on certain conditions. And you should know that's not how grace comes into our life and flows through our life. Joseph's willingness to be obedient to God's direction is what enables him to participate in God's redemptive plan of redemption in the world. And that takes a lot of courage to do. 
The simple truth is that we learn a lot of things about ourselves. Let's just see how many's learned anything about yourself since you were in high school. <laughs> and how many, everything you've learned about yourself since you were in high school was fulfilling, rewarding, and satisfying. That's what I thought. We, we learn a lot of things about ourselves. But here's what's true. You will not learn the same things about yourself or about your world or about God if you just take the path of your own choosing. You see, when God gives us direction in life, he's going to have you hang around people you would rather avoid. He's going to have you give things you would rather keep. He's going to have you deal things you would rather hide. God will force us, challenge us, call us to deal with things that reveal things about our heart we didn't know was there. And that's how the grace of God transforms us one day at a time. That's how it happens. So a question. Let's suppose you go to bed tonight. And let's suppose you have a dream. And let's suppose an angel shows up in your dream. What do you think the angel would say to you? Do you think that, and by the way, we all have dreams, not just the ones we have when we're asleep at night. We all have goals. We all have ambitions. We all have things we'd like to achieve and accomplish. We all have dreams. Does God have the right to invade your dreams? Well, what do you think the angel would say to you? Do you imagine that the message would be to let you off the hook for some challenging assignment that you've been handed? Or to escape some previous commitment that you have made? Or do you think that he may encourage you to face the things that you're afraid of and that you'll find a resource of his grace you didn't know existed and that you'll be part of a redemptive plan that you not only get to enjoy, but you get to share? See, Christmas, it reminds us this isn't just an inspiring story of a rags-to-riches individual who was born into abject poverty in a third-world nation. God has come not incognito, but incarnate. He has not come to hide himself amongst us, but to reveal himself to us and to promise to be with us. And that makes all the difference. You believe that, and you will find the courage to face your fears. Let's bow our heads this morning. Uh, Father, this is a really challenging season for us because we have so many responsibilities and obligations. We have things to do with and for family. We have things to do with and for work and church and friends, neighbors. And so we get a little bit overwhelmed. We get a little bit frustrated. And the truth is, a lot of the things we do is just because we're afraid that we'll disappoint someone or they'll think less of us. Would you help us this Christmas season to face our fears? To not be afraid to do the right thing, even if it costs us something. And to not be afraid to do the gracious thing, even if there's people around us who wouldn't understand. Would you help us know that in all of these things, you have come to be with us. That regardless of what we have to go back to or stay in, you have not abandoned us, that you are with us in the midst of all of it. Help us find our courage and our strength in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me this morning?